Okay, hello and welcome everybody to the second day of our conference, Genome Editing in Europe, New Agenda or New Disputes, which is jointly organized by the German National Academy of Sciences and the German Research, Research Foundation. My name is Henning Steinecke, I'm a policy advisor here at the National Academy, and I will be your host for the next session. First one technical remark, if you like to post the question, just put it in the question and answer uh, function in Zoom. Uh, we, we will then check all the questions. Usually it becomes a lot of uh, questions here. Okay, now to the conference. Today we will widen our view to international approaches on regulating genome editing with presentations from experts around the world. The moderator of the session will be Pete van der Meer. Pete is professor at the University of Ghent and the Free University of Brussels. And he teaches biotechnology regulation and has been involved in this field for well over 30 years in various capacities. Most importantly, he has been involved in the negotiations for the GMO directives in the late 80s and also in the revisions in the late 90s. So Pete, the virtual floor is yours. Pete, your microphone is still off should work now, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Henning, for this very kind introduction. And my, my thanks to Leopoldina for inviting me. And in this case, a special thanks because um, they know that I'm one of those people that does not agree with their conclusion that the 2018 court ruling means that all genome edited organisms. Um, that conclusion is an assumption. It's not something that the ruling says. The, the ruling was about the scope of the mutagenesis exemption and not about the scope of the GMO definition. Now, to be fair, Leo Podina was not the only one making such a statement. Ever since the ruling came out, there have been many statements to this effect that uh, all genome edited organisms are GMOs in the, the sense of the direct directive. Um, and what is very striking is that the vast majority of those statements were not accompanied by any analysis. They just repeated each other. And only in a few cases, such as the Leo Podina report, was there some analysis underlying the statement but mostly those analyses were along the lines that the ruling mentions ODM and SDN, and therefore all genome edited organ organisms are GMOs. Uh, I believe that such a, an argumentation doesn't hold because the reference to ODM and SDN did not stand in itself. Um, I'll be happy to come back to, to that in the discussion. Uh, more importantly, uh, the fact that the implication of the course ruling are not settled also appears from the fact that the European Council has requested a study regarding the status of novel genomic techniques on the union law. Uh, had that been clear, then the council would not have requested this. So I can only hope that the commission will come at a thorough analysis of the ruling and of the GMO definition uh, in relation to genome editing and other novel genomic techniques, um, because this, this uncertainty that has now continued since 2007 is very bad. Uh, to be very, very clear, speaking as a former regulator, it would be very poor governance if we would embark on the process of amending the law on the basis of incomplete reading of a court ruling. Uh, finally, as another kickoff for the, the discussions later on, um, what also adds to the uncertainty is the ease with which people make blanket statements uh, in, in this whole debate. I've heard yesterday several times references to a ban on GMOs in Europe. There is no ban. I've also heard a statement that in other countries, genome edited are, organisms are not covered by the regulations. That's not correct. Some are, some are not. We will hear it later on today. So with this brief introduction, um, I'm happy to give the floor to Professor Lona Kaport from the Erasmus University of Rotterdam uh, and the Commission on Genetic Modification of the Netherlands. Lonneke, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Pete. Um, well, you opened the floor uh, with quite a statement on the court ruling. Um, uh, I will try to share my, um, my screen. Um, files, just a second. It's not working now. Um, I don't know. Um, someone from the technical staff, I cannot share my, um, my screen. Oh, yeah, I can. Sorry. So, uh, well, uh, hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I had some problems with my presentation. As you can see, I'm unfortunately not a professor uh, yet. <laughs> I'm an associate professor, so that's a small correction. But I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Dutch Committee on Genetic Modification. 
and uh, I work with uh, uh, the regulation of GMOs for about 10 years now. So maybe um, I can still add something to the discussion. Uh, I was asked to outline the regulations on GEOs in, uh, in Europe. And a lot have uh, already been said about this topic. So actually, I doubted yesterday whether I could add something to it. Um, Professor Dederer already provided an overview of the most important provisions of the directive and of the basic tenets of the court case. And I favor his explanation of the front door and the back, for, uh, back door metaphor. And I will try to add something to that. And I will, uh, I will present a little broader overview of the regulation and I will um, discuss a bit more on the, uh, the court ruling and I will uh, comment on uh, some ways out of the deadlock in Europe. So um, if, we hear, if you see my screen here, um, did, this is an overview of the regulation on GMOs. So not GEOs, but GMOs in Europe. So it, uh, it builds on three pillars, one for contained use, one for deliberate release or field, field trials, and one for placing on the market. As you see in the, in the, in, in the, in the slide, that contained, both contained use and field trials are organized by national regulation. That means that in all these pillars, uh, GMOs needs approval, but it differs how the approval procedure is organized. And uh, for contained use and deliberate release, that uh, differs from member state to member state. So, um, and in, in all, these, uh, all these procedures, risk assessment is uh, a key uh, point. Uh, but only for um, placing on the market, there's a, a kind of a, a different uh, procedure. There it's not only risk assessment, but also risk management. And I will explain why this is. Uh, I think placing on the market is something that we should zoom in to because here all the problems start and all the discussions we, we are talking about for, uh, for years, but also especially in this conference, find place in, um, in this pillar. So um, this process starts with, a, uh, if you want a, a license for uh, working with GMOs or placing them on the market, uh, it starts with a notification. And this notification includes a risk ass assessment and it's submitted to the competent authority within one member state. And uh, this authority assesses the application and submits it to the EFSA which uh, assesses the application then and gives a recommendation uh, to the committee. And it's only about a, a risk uh, assessment. So here the risk assessment part finds place. Uh, the committee sends the proposal of, in which they say uh, uh, licensing or not uh, to the member states and they discuss it and uh, they have to vote and, uh, dish and need to arrive at a decision based on a qualified majority. And here it follows the typical European comitology procedure. If a no qualified majority is reached, then it's up to the EC. They can revise the proposal or they can send it to the appeal committee, which is uh, again uh, consists of uh, representatives from EU member states. And again, they have to decide by a qualified majority. If that fails, if that process fails, then it's again up to the European Committee to make a final decision. Well, you can all imagine, and you all know, um, most of you are scientists, uh, this procedure is very time consuming and can become really complex. And especially in European practice, member states uh, never reach uh, a majority, uh, a qualified majority. And it always ends up that it's up to the committee to make a decision. And uh, the committee seems reluctant to do so. And here we have a kind of de a deadlock. Pete was, uh, 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 was referring to a ban of GMOs, but it's, uh, I would uh, prefer to uh, frame it in, in terms of a deadlock. So uh, the procedure are stuck. And uh, trying to break through this uh, deadlock, the EU implemented the Directive 2015 and 412. And that makes it possible for member states to restrict or prohibit the cultivation of GMOs in their territory. And it was expected that due to this possibility, member states would not uh, longer vote against uh, licensing. But 
again, the deadlock remains, uh, they didn't change their voting behavior. But um, we could question if, uh, uh, because this conference is not about GMOs, but GEOs. So back to the question uh, that was asked to me, how uh, is it organized? How, is, how are GEOs regulated? And then we, we zoom back, to, we come back to the first slide. And uh, I marked uh, the contained use and deliberate release. Um, member states have the, the liberty to draft their, their own or to organize their own procedures and to draft their own law and thus its categorizations, but they have to be in line with the directive. And under Dutch law, as well as in French law, uh, mutagenesis um, uh, techniques are not considered uh, GMOs. And uh, you all know that this was uh, uh, the basis of the court case we discuss uh, uh, extensively, intensively uh, during this conference. And we see here that in, in, the, in, the, in the article of the French Environmental Code, it says that the techniques which are not considered to give rise to genetic modification are the following, and mutagenesis is one of them. And here they, it seems a bit to co uh, conflict with the Article 3 of the directive. Techniques of genetic modifications are mutagenesis. And here, um, as we all know, uh, this ended up uh, at the Court uh, of uh, Justice, uh, the European Court of Justice, because uh, some uh, agri agricultural organizations uh, saw a contradiction between those um, articles and uh, brought it to the French court and the French court uh, asked pr uh, prejudicial questions about these provisions. So the core of these questions, and some of you already, uh, uh, we already discussed it, so I want to uh, not uh, to, to, to be too long on this page. And uh, are products of mutagenesis GMOs within the meaning of Directive 2001-18? Even if they're attempt okay, sorry, no. two minutes. Okay, then I I I, I continue. I uh, leave this part because I want to go. We all know these questions. We also know the uh, uh, the answers. Or organisms obtained by mutagenesis are GMOs within the meaning of Directive 2001-18. Um, so uh, it's it for for a, for a legal scholar. It's not really strange because if you follow. Uh, the text, the literally uh, uh, meaning of the text, there uh, it says the techniques of genetic modifications, Article 3, are listed in Annex 1b. They are, uh, the, the directive does not apply to them, and their, uh, uh, mutagenesis is on this list. That gives us three tastes. The techniques that result in GMOs and are therefore subject to the obligations, techniques that do not result in GMOs and are therefore not subject to the directive and those who are GMOs but are nevertheless exempt from the objective. And in the French and the Dutch law, we saw that the last category was not, uh, uh, was not there. So there were only two tastes. And uh, so in practice, it doesn't make a difference because they're both exempted from, from the, the directive. But in uh, with the court ruling, it suddenly makes... Uh, it, it, it makes a difference. There is a difference between those two categories. And um, I think, and, and here I, I, I have to think about the statement that Pete made uh, at the start of this uh, session. Uh, I think the wrong question was asked because what we expected or what scientists expected that there was a, that a distinction was made between GMOs and GEOs in context of the first question but the court didn't. They did that in the second question, and uh, therefore they are considered GMOs, but they don't have a long safety record. And here we see a difference between legal interpretation and um, between um, uh, the biotechnology, uh, but bi biotechnological reality. Um, so what options are left? Uh, and then I, I will cut it, I make it as brief as possible. Uh, yesterday we talked about changing legislation, short-term solutions and long-term solutions. Uh, I want to uh, comment on that um, because I think it's very hard to change law because of comitology, because of the political 
procedures around it. Uh, so I would prefer to take baby steps, but I don't have time to discuss those baby steps. So if, if you have any questions on it, I'm, I, can ask, uh, I can answer them uh, after my presentation or you can email me about it. And I, will, I have a paper on this so I can send it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lonneke. And um, I very much agree with you what you said that, that the difficulty here is the difference in interpretation between scientists and lawyers and that has confused the debate tremendously. Um, we will see this coming back, I trust, in the, in the discussions and to how to find a way forward. Um, as I'm being instructed to stick to the time by Henning, I'm inviting the next speaker, which will be uh, Professor Corinne Ludlow from the Monash University. Um, Corinne is, is also a lawyer. And without further ado, I hand you uh, the screen over to you, Corinne. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to, uh, for, to all of you for inviting me to speak with you. It's, it's an honour. Um, so Australia has uh, two national regimes that are particularly relevant to the regulation of uh, GEOs and GMOs. The first one is the Gene Technology Scheme, which regulates what we call in Australia genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, including crops from R&D through to commercial production. We also have a separate national food regulatory scheme which regulates GM food. Like the EU's approach, uh, Australia requires all dealings with GMOs and GM food to be authorised under the relevant schemes. But there are different forms of authorisation corresponding with uh, the potential risks posed by the particular GMO. So the current state of what I'll call GEO, genome edited organisms in Australia, is that the various regulators have decided that GEOs produced using SDN1 or null segregates will not be regulated and are not regulated, but they are still considering how to further modernise their regulation to address GEOs. Some amendments have already been made to the gene technology scheme, but further amendments can be expected. Neither scheme regulates GEOs created using SDN1 or null segregates, but that is for different reasons. While the, the use of gene technology is the trigger for both of these schemes, the schemes use different definitions of that term. To copy Hans George's wonderful um, explanation yesterday, they use different front doors, which as you can imagine, causes some confusion. If you can look to the bottom uh, line on this table, you can see the two different definitions used by the two schemes. And what that means is that for the gene technology scheme, all genome editing is gene technology, but for the food regulatory scheme, that's not the case. So if we focus in on the gene technology scheme first, um, this scheme was reviewed in the past few years and amendments were finally made at the end of last year in response to GEOs. As I said, uh, it has been decided that genome editing is gene technology for the purposes of these regulations because genome editing modifies genetic material and that's all that is required. Therefore, authorization is needed to do genome editing in Australia. Nevertheless, the final plant may not actually be a GMO. If it is a GMO, it will have to comply with the further rules of the regulatory scheme. When the regulatory scheme was created, it was recognised that natural modifications to genetic material occur, and also that deliberate random mutagenesis had been occurring for more than 60 years. Organisms produced that way, and the processes used to produce them, were expressly excluded from regulation at the time that the scheme was created. So if we return to thinking about GEOs, it has been decided and recognised that GEOs created using SDN1 and null segregates do not pose any different or greater risks compared with the older mutants. Therefore, it was decided that such GEOs were not regulated as GMOs. Amendments have been made following that decision to ensure that their decision is correct, just to uh, 
protect their backs, as you would say. So they've made a number of amendments to the regulations to reflect that decision. Uh, firstly, they've removed the previous mutant exception from the definition of GMO and replaced it with more specific exceptions. Three further exceptions have been added, particularly aimed at this new science. First of all, mutants are excluded, provided that the mutational event does not involve the introduction of any foreign nucleic acid. Secondly, organisms modified by the repair of single-stranded or double-stranded breaks induced by a SDN are also excluded, provided no nucleic acid repair template is used. And finally, null segregates are excluded as GMOs. They also added an additional regulation that makes it clear that organisms created using SDN and a nucleic acid repair template, or ODM, are included as GMOs, so they will be regulated. So what are the remaining problems that need to be addressed for this regulatory scheme? One that has been identified is that by naming particular molecular tools such as SDN, they are putting at risk having the same problem arise as technology develops. They can expect that they will become outdated. Secondly, even after these amendments, the gene technology scheme will continue to regulate many GEOs, despite some of them being of no greater risk than plants produced using genome, sorry, random uh, mutagenesis or being identical to natural variants. The uh, regulator and policy setting body have confirmed though that they will continue to use a process trigger. They will continue to use gene technology as the trigger point for regulation. There is a uh, proposed future plan to create further amendments to refine the definitions and to introduce further risk tiering into the regulation. Turning to the food regulatory scheme, it also has been reviewed and that was finished at the end of last year. It was found that the definitions in this scheme are also now outdated and unclear and no longer fit for purpose. The regulator has also considered whether a pre-market safety assessment of GEOs is justified based on the risk posed either by the modification of the genome or changes to a food's characteristics. Based on the uh, regulator's interpretation of what gene technology means for this scheme, remembering it has a different definition to the other scheme, they've created three classes of techniques used to modify genomes. The first two classes will not be considered to be food produced using gene technology and therefore will not be regulated as GM food. They are GEOs with no DNA present in the, sorry, no new DNA present in the organism's genome and null segregates. The third class will be regulated as food produced using gene technology and is therefore considered GM food. Is, this, this class comprises GEOs where the organism's genome contains new DNA, such as where transgenesis, cisgenesis or intragenesis are used. These are considered to be recombinant DNA techniques and therefore fall within the relevant definition. However, the regulator has noted that the food produced by cisgenic organisms would be similar to food produced through crossbreeding in terms of the risks that it creates. So what are the problems that are remaining for this scheme? They are now considering how to modernise their definitions to address the identified problems. They're also addressing whether to change to a process or product based definition system. They are considering whether um, organisms, or sorry, food produced by organisms in class one and class three will require a pre-market safety assessment, although they have noted that they would exclude some foods in class three from such an assessment. Yes. Thank you. In 2020, so February this year, the Food Authority began the process of making these amendments and undertaking these further studies but that process has been stalled due to the pandemic. Nevertheless, we do know that the Food Authority considers that the risks posed by GEO foods are not great, and that after 20 years regulating the traditional GM foods, it's very unlikely, they think, that unintended changes will be harmful 
or any more dangerous than changes from random mutagenesis or conventional breeding. They've also said that cisgenesis and GM rootstock grafting, organisms created in those ways, could be excluded from a safety assessment. So in conclusion, um, the, the relevance of the fact that GEOs will in some cases be equivalent with conventionally bred plants or even naturally occurring variants is still under review by both regulators. Domestically, the different definitions is permitted in a legal sense, but it is causing confusion for consumers, producers, and also the regulators themselves. The regulators have also acknowledged that there can be important economic consequences if regulation is unclear and that they still have some work to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corinne, for a very clear explanation about a very complex situation, especially having different regimes and, and differentiations. Um, here, that too we will be discussing in the, uh, the Q&A, I expect. Let's move quickly to the next speaker, Professor Tatsuya Ishii from the, uh, the Hokkaido University in Japan. Uh, Tatsuya, very good to see you again, and the floor is yours. Yes. So, um, okay, uh, uh, good, uh, good morning or uh, good evening. I'm Tetsuya Ishii from Japan. I'm with Hokkaido University and the Science Council of Japan. Today I talk about GEO, but at first I want to talk about uh, G GM crops and Japan. Then the I introduce one example of field trial gene edited crop. Then the, I explain the regulation of uh, genome editing in Japan and the status quo of GEO in Japan. Then I uh, round up the future uh, agriculture uh, genome edited product in Japan. So, uh, Japan is one of big GM importers. Here, Japan, it is light greens. Light green means the importing biotech crops. Now, uh, Japan approved many uh, G, uh, GMO, especially G, GM crops. But in Japan, it imports many, uh, much amount of uh, GE crops, but uh, there is no commercial cultivation of GE plant for food in Japan, and no approval, no approval of uh, GM animal for food in Japan. Please keep it in mind. Uh, this is a very complex picture, but I, I want to uh, explain. Uh, uh, genome editing is uh, start by using artificial DNA cutting enzyme, nucleus, it's normally bacterial enzymes. Then the, if when, uh, researcher uh, introduce this nucleus, it can be the form is a DNA, mRNA, or protein. This is very important. And uh, SDN1, two, threes. And uh, I want to keep Pay attention to SDN2 because this is process is similar to SDN3. It uh, introduce also introduce DNA fragment, and but product is similar to SDN1. Please keep it in mind. And the defect is uh, of target effect and uh, unintentional gene insertions. This does not mean this SDN3 or G insertions. So, past free trial G crop is ongoing in Japan. It's up, it was approved uh, five years ago. Then it is further going to cultivated in the field. It, this uh, uh, rice was. Uh, employed CRISPR-Cas9 to disrupt two D 
different genes to increase grain size and numbers. But this trial was, was approved as a use of LMO without content because several Cas9 gene copy integrated in the uh, genome of rice. So this is uh, this uh, uh, genome edited rice is the uh, approved. Its use was approved by other one one of GMOs. Then the two years ago, uh, the government set up integrated innovation strategy. In the it, the government said six different ministry to consider clarification, clarify handling of a GE oats under the Cartagena Act. It is a GMO laws, and also the product, the food product, consider it uh, food sanitation act. So uh, it order was uh, 2018, but the government uh, imposed that this task to finish within this same years. It's a very task, big task. In the in the papers, uh, promoting public important understanding is trust, but it emphasis emphasize public benefit. So this is a very complex picture under the scheme of regulation by Cartagena law. But I want to, uh, and I want, want you uh, pay attention to exemption items. So if you want to exclude the G, any G, GEO from the Cartagena law, you can amend these items, but the ministry did not touch law and audience. So how did uh, consider the regulation of GEO? They issued a tentative policy document, especially Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Health. Uh, the paper uh, read the handling of GEO other ministries. So MOE's paper direct the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Ministry uh, of Agriculture. Ministry of Health paper uh, direct uh, consumer uh, affairs agencies. So I want to ask, pay attention to this difference. The, under the Cartagena law, only SDN1 is ex uh, excluded from the GEO by this tentative paper. But please say, look at this. Uh, Miss food sanitation under the food sanitation law, SDN1 and SDN2 were excluded. And MAF is amend now amending, Ministry of Agriculture is amending Japanese agriculture standards to exclude GEO from organic culture, it's a bit opposite to direction regulations. Like it, it is, so our math is uh, dealing with GEO, likewise GMOs. So now Minister of Health want to promote public understanding of GEO. They made this brochure for con consumers. So explain how is, what, what, what kind of difference of any breeding techniques. Then the off-target effect. This, the question and answer is, answer is off-target effect is, is, is very uh, serious. So uh, the answer is because mutant with unwanted trait can be screened out by mating and section. The possibility of GE food being harmful to health is considered very low, simply explained so, but where is evidence? And does this work for risk communications? So, yeah. so you have two minutes. Yes, uh, Minister of Health explain how to notify into 
information on GE flu. Then the uh, ministry issued a tentative paper to exclude GE, some type, type of GEO from GMO regulations. But uh, ministry asked researcher or developer uh, prior consultations. So this process is needed, but this is not mandatory. So in this situation, SN12 is not reviewed, but just submitted information is announced on the uh, ministry website and the company can uh, distribute for sales. But now, this uh, scheme is introduced one year ago, but uh, the, there was zero, no notification on GEO, food made beer SDN1 or two, or feed the trial on SDN1. Satoya, can you come to conclusions, please? And yes. to the organizers, can I get the video yes, back? Yes, yes. So uh, I want to say Japanese regulatory approach is not optimized. So uh, because uh, Japanese companies seek possibility outside uh, Japan, this company asks the US uh, Department of Agriculture to confirm their GE tomato is not plant based under uh, G GM, US GMO uh, regulations. So I want to conclude this uh, sentence. In the near future, the first agriculture GEO in Japan could be an important import from US as the first GMO was. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tetsuya, for your, again, a clear presentation on a complex situation. Um, I think these three presentations were good food for the discussion. Um, I understand there are quite a number of questions and I hand over to Henning to read out the questions. Uh, and if you can start with the ones directed to specific speakers, okay? Yes, thank you. Um, actually, there was uh, a question directly to Lonic Port uh, asking if um, it would be maybe feasible an amendment of implementing regulation, laying out the risk assessment approach for GM foods and feed uh, as an alternative option. For example, uh, by requiring less data for certain types of genetic modifications. And uh, another one, actually there was a lot of interest on the uh, Australian um, approach. And uh, one question was already answered, I think, uh, regarding multiple use of SDN1. Uh, but there is another question popping up like three times uh, if multiplexing is excluded in the uh, in the uh, Australian approach, if, especially if uh, there is no repair template used. Shall I, I start, Annie? Is that, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the question was uh, whether it's possible within this framework to uh, to have some kind of procedure that for some organism less data was required but I, I also read some of the questions that also refer to uh, how it, is it possible to regulate when we have a long safety records that that's the way i understood the questions and that was actually the point i uh, a year ago i uh, or it's uh, almost half a year ago I published an, uh, a research report together with uh, a few colleagues, uh, Willem-Jan Kortleven and Hans Bergmans and uh, Rick Kleinjans. And there we were exactly discussing these kind of options. And I think that that option to, to make, uh, to, to find a way to get a long safety record is one of those baby steps. And there are actually two ways to, to, to get to that. And one is, um, bring it to court again, uh, ask a prejudicial uh, question, um, because that's something that is still unclear, what is meant with a long safety record? So that, that's, it is possible to ask a question about that. Uh, and I think that's not uh, involved, that has nothing to do with um, those political uh, uh, European situation of comatology. So, so that's a way out. 
And I think uh, that um, within contained use and uh, finally also in deliberate release, you can build such a long safety record. So these are still ways that we can, uh, uh, we can uh, paths that we can follow to get a long safety record. So I, I definitely think that there's uh, a way out in that option. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'll, I'll answer the other question. Um, thank you about, uh, for the question about multiplexing. Uh, I, I suspect that it would not matter that it was multiplexing rather than just one SDN1 change or uh, a, a, a whatever number of SDN1 changes were made because uh, the gene technology scheme is concerned with um, its, its ambition, I suppose, is to address concern about the fact that humankind can control what the genetic nature of an organism is and, and use a science. And so if it's made a decision that SDN1 changes don't, don't raise that issue, they're more like what we've, we've previously been comfortable with, I can't see why the number of those changes would change their attitude. And for the food regulatory scheme, it's, it's concerned about the presence of new DNA in the organism. That's what the definition confines them to. And so simply because a number of changes have been made, that, that should mean the exception should continue to apply. So or it just won't fall within gene technology. That's, that's what its decisions has been, the regulator's decision. So multiplexing shouldn't change the attitude of the regulators, I don't think. Although there was a question, if you multiplexed a GMO, would it then be excluded? And the answer would be no, it's a GMO, it will be regulated as a GMO. It can't change its nature through multiplexing, although it's an interesting question, but I wouldn't think that that would protect you from regulation. Thank you. Okay, Henning, you're, you have a few more questions, I guess, on your list. And let me urge all the speakers to be brief in their answers. We have only 20 minutes left. Yeah, I, I received actually a question uh, from one of our speakers from yesterday as well, uh, Petra Yora, Yora she, she asked, what exactly should GEO mean? And because this could be very different kinds of organisms from transgenic to mutants. And if it really does make sense to build such a GEO category, I think this question goes to everybody or whoever wants to answer. Actually, Henning, if, if you allow me as a moderator to just fully agree with that comment, uh, I said earlier that this debate suffers from blanket statements, from oversimplifications. Genome editing, uh, techniques such as CRISPR can result in very small changes and can result in very complex and, and advanced changes. And we should keep that differentiation in mind. And you see the differentiation in various countries' regulations. Um, small changes, SDN, one, usually not covered, either exempted or not covered to begin with. But as more complex changes using a template such as SDN3 are covered. And it will be very important to get clarity on this. But it's a very pertinent comment from you, from uh, Petra. And it's also one of the reasons why the court ruling doesn't define any of this. So therefore, you cannot read too much into it. And we should stop doing that. And I'd be very interested to hear, to hear the, uh, the views of the other three speakers. So the uh, food regulator in Australia doesn't use the term genome editing. It uses the term new breeding techniques to try and indicate that it's broader. But the gene technology regulator is staying with genome editing as its term. Well, I'm more in line with, uh, um, I, I agree with Pete. Uh, what uh, what he, he says is, um, we were dealing here with um, simplifications and categorizations, and that's that's always the problem with law. And I can say that as a legal schooler, uh, I think um, that it's the same for GMOs of genetic modification. It, it's defined in a legal context, and therefore, it, it, it at the at the moment it, it is in the law, it has a, it gets a different meaning than in, uh, in biology or in, in, in chemics. So uh, if, if we want to have a definition on uh, genome editing uh, organisms, we will face a similar problem and we, we will have the similar discussions because law tends to simplify uh, and categorize while it's impossible to do so in, uh, for these matters. So uh, I agree uh, uh, with Pete on that. 
Thank you, Lonica. And Satsuya, any additional observations? Yes, uh, I think uh, genome editing is a new uh, biotechnologies. So in one thing, we have to see it from the process. While, but in another thing, you can see it just result or product. So uh, in Japan, the Kaltai and Low and Food Sanitation Law differently view gen genome editing or genome edited food. Thank you. And, and I, I think you'll see this kind of differentiation appearing in, in many other countries too, in Latin America, in North America, and so forth. Any, any further questions? Yes. Um, actually, there was more or less technical question regarding the European uh, court ruling and the opinion of the Commission. Um, Didier is asking uh, the European Court of Justice argumented in the context of the Directive 2001 uh, 18EC. But the Commission interprets this opinion as applying also the contained use. And um, he thinks this is questionable and he would like to hear the, the uh, opinion of the speakers. And if I'm allowed to say another one, uh, there is somebody um, calling himself an outsider, <laughs> I would say, of the, of, the, uh, uh, this, of the whole discussion, which I personally uh, really appreciate uh, that uh, he is um, participating. So Mark is asking, he has the impression that in Australia it's very clear and open and straight process, uh, also as a dynamic process, but it doesn't seem to be the case in Europe. And um, he would like to hear, I think, Pete, perhaps your opinion about uh, the European position. Okay, can I suggest that we first get a brief comment from Karin on the observation about the Australian system, perhaps Lonica on the contained use, and I'll be happy to come to the last general observation. Karin? <laughs> I'm very glad it appears that way. Um, we, of course, are only one country, unlike the EU, but uh, there are differences. Um, they are actually looking at reforming the way they make amendments because they've decided it is too cumbersome and too long. So it, it, I'm glad it appears efficient. It's not as efficient as it could be, though. It could be improved. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to add something to that because I think it's a very interesting observation made here. Uh, and what I, uh, when I heard the presentation about the J Japanese situation, I see similar complexities as in Europe. And I was always thinking that it it was um, uh, one of the uh, problems within the EU is that we have so many member states with different systems, but also different uh, social backgrounds. But uh, Japan, uh, we can shake hands. It seems very complex there as well. Um, that's an observation I want to make. Well, uh, whether the European ruling also counts for contained use. Um, I, I don't know how to uh, really how to understand this question, but my observation is that it also counts for contained use, but that within contained use we have less of a deadlock than in placing on the market, because uh, it's easier in some member states to get a license or to get an uh, to get an approval. Uh, so here the problem is 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 less urgent. Um, but maybe uh, uh, Pete uh, disagrees with me on this. <laughs> I see him laughing. Uh, so I give the floor uh, to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Let, let me first agree with you um, on the first point. On, I always give this example. If you look at the US system, the regulatory system for biosafety, it is horribly complex. It has three regulatory agencies with different definitions and different procedures, et cetera. Nevertheless, for long that system worked because it was one government that wanted it to work. The European system, and, and I've been involved in the development of it, is on paper very, very well structured and very straightforward. And it has worked for a number of years very well in the early 90s. But the one drawback that we have, and Lonica mentioned it, is that this is not one country. This is 28 or now 27 soon. So therefore, that adds a complexity that, that is in no system. The, the US system, it would not be uh, approved or, or decided by EPA, FDA, or USDA, but by the, the 50 states would be very, very different. And so it, it all depends on, on the implementation there. 
As regards to contained use, I, I tend to agree with Didier that um, given the fact that the contained use directive has its own definition of a genetically modified microorganism, which is slightly different from the, the, the release directive, um, I would dare to say, don't read too much in the, in the court ruling and let's stick to release. Henning? Yeah. Okay, uh, I have two more questions. Um, there is one to Karim uh, asking about um, the deliberate epigenetic modifications, if they have been subject to, to any discussion in Australia, which means not changing the DNA sequence, but maybe temporarily modifying by methylation and using RNA. And the other one goes to uh, Tatsuya. Tatsuya, and if um, George is asking if he got it right, that SDN2 is regulated differently in Japan, uh, with not regulated under health regime, but regulated under environment regime. Okay, uh, so with, with respect to epigenetic changes, which is a wonderful question, I, I know I've started thinking about it, but I haven't seen any indication that the regulators have. They haven't publicly released any information on that aspect yet, so don't know. <laughs> Uh, I want to explain why uh, Japan differently handled SDN2 because it's up to the applied law difference because in the bio uh, regarding the biodiversity, the Cartagena law see a bit basically see a GM product, but while uh, caring about the process, but uh, food sanitation law see the processed food, so uh, it's a final product. So it focus on the uh, uh, result. So in this sense, SDN two can be similar to SDN one, a, a bit small uh, base change. So, uh, so the in Japan, food sanitation law excluded, excluded SDN2 as well as SDN21 from the GMO definitions. Okay, thank you, Henning. Any further questions? If I got it right, I think that's all the questions we received so far. Okay. Then, since we are inching towards the uh, half past one mark, um, let me ask the, the speakers whether they have any final re observations, remarks, and questions. And let me go in reverse order. First, start with Tatsuya. Any further questions, observations you have? I want to ask Karin, uh, in Australia, how, how about uh, organic agriculture? I, I want to say, in Japan, uh, Japanese Ministry of Agriculture, CGEO, is similar to uh, GMO. So they excluded, excluded uh, GEO from organic food. How about, how about it in Australia, organic food hundred? Yes. So in Australia, domestically within the country, there is actually no legislation or regulation from the government. It's a uh, voluntary, you know, the associations together themselves decide what their rules are and their rules exclude GMOs. Um, I suspect they will expand to exclude GEOs as well. Okay. They've be excluded nanotechnology. So as each new technology comes on, they uh, exclude it. Um, there is an ex, uh, export rule uh, which the government has uh, introduced, but it reflects the domestic rule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can send you a paper on that. <laughs> okay. And Karen, since you have the floor, any, any further questions and observations from your side? Uh, just the, as we all know, the science is going to keep moving. We've had questions about epigenetics uh, that, you know, this focus on describing particular molecular tools is going to cause problems for the regulators, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lonica. 
Uh, thank you. Um, I have some uh, some final remarks. Um, I think that um, I, we we share the conclusion that the European regulation now is not future proof, and I'm I'm very pleased to hear uh, from other uh, parts of uh, of the world uh, how it's organized. I also want to uh, point at a report written by the Dutch Committee on. Uh, genetic modification, which also made a comparison between the Canadian system and, and, and the European system. And uh, they, uh, they, their analysis is very thorough. So it's, it's not only comparison the law, but they also uh, held a lot of interviews. So I think uh, for the, uh, the rationale of this conference, it can be very interesting to, to read this report. It's, it's in English, if anyone wants to have it, send me an email and I can send it to you. So. Okay, thank you very much. In the meantime, I understand that Henning has a few more questions. Well, at least one. Um, there is one question asking uh, how the European regulation is seen in Australia and Japan. What is your vision on the European regulation? Okay, Karin, this is your opportunity to be kind and diplomatic, okay? Uh, it's certainly front of mind when our regulators are trying to think what to do. They're aware that it can create trade difficulties. Um, the general public, I don't think they're aware that Europe has a different approach to us. I think it, within Australia, they think that the world does what we do, but the regulators are certainly very aware of the differences and are keeping that in mind as they review our laws. Is that diplomatic enough? <laughs> Thank you very much, Tetsuya. Can you match that? Uh, I I have been observe, observed the European study on GMO uh, G, uh, genome editing regulations. So uh, EU org organization uh, making paper on the regu regulatory proposal, but uh, it was not the regulation GMO regulation was not amended so far. Then the court rulings. So where is opportunities. Why opportunity was lost? We have to see it again. It. Thank you. I think your observation of, of a lost opportunity or possibly a lost opportunity is a, is a good one. I understand that in the meantime, Henning has one more question. Yeah, actually, now I have two. Um, uh, there is one question asking if it wouldn't be more wise to uh, judging the products and not the techniques. I think we discussed already yesterday, but uh, anyway. And um, there is another question asking if it would be uh, somehow uh, helpful uh, to have a centralized decision uh, within the EU, by an EU body and, and not within the member countries. Um, why not torture Lonnie any further? So let me, let me take these questions and I'll be happy to ask her view as well. Um, so let me take the last one first about, about why not have a central uh, authority. It, it, it happens with, in many other fields that there's just one central decision-making field. There are a few of those fields where we have seen the effects of subsidiarity, uh, that some of the decision-making is still with the, uh, with the member states or even pushed back to the member states, as we have seen with the, the regulation from 2015. Uh, it, this is just a very difficult uh, political matter uh, and the funny thing is, when I worked for the Dutch government in the uh, in the in the mid '80s uh, and, and the early '90s, I could see that the Commission was always very keen to grab as much power as they could and decision power. Now I see them just pushing back as much as they can because it's a very unfortunate thing they want to get rid of it, whether it's pesticides or GMOs, etc. So this will be a bal balancing going back and forth uh, for many uh, many years to come, I guess. Uh, let me add a few more quick observations. First, first about this whole thing about product and process. The way these regulations are designed and written, if you read them very carefully, is they're process triggered and product based. And this it has been published many times that both the, the technique used and the, the resulting organism have to be taken into account. Uh, and that you can see in the article and the annexes that are there. Uh, just connecting very quickly to the questions of multiplexing, uh, that too is, is, is a very general thing or the generalization I would say in all those cases, ask yourself whether the resulting organism is something that would fall under Article 2, i.e. whether that uh, would occur in nature, that, that particular genetic alteration. 
And this connects and also to another observation about something that Corinne says that we can be very specific now in detailing and defining genome editing. By the time we've done that, and it will take many years, there are new techniques again coming around the corner. Uh, and then you're back to square one and you have to do this uh, all over again. And that comes back to the, uh, the question whether the regulation is future proof. I would submit that it actually is, is that we can still sensibly uh, interpret the, the, the definitions in a way that actually makes sense, that are proportionate, uh, and that are along the lines <clears throat> of what is happening in other countries. But it all comes to, to, uh, to interpretation. Uh, and I would just end with a, a very important line that I, I give my students almost every day, uh, read the text and read the text over and over again. I have been involved in these regulations for many years and very often I just read an article and I think, hey, there's something in there. So just as, as that could be the last comment because it is, it is 1.30 now, uh, read the text many times again. That would be a great, uh, a great step forward and not oversimplify things. With this Henning, I'm happy to give back to you again for further domestic announcements. Actually, my announcement is that we would like to see everybody and even more people uh, in the next session, which will start. Sorry, I don't, I don't have it. For, uh, for Berlin time, uh, four o'clock Berlin time. Uh, so since then, everybody can think about genome editing and regulation and read the texts again and again. And uh, afterwards, we can see each other. Okay. Thank you. And let, and let me join you here in, in thanking the speakers one more time, the three speakers. Thanks very much. Uh, I know it's, it's late in the evening for you, so very much appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All the best. Thank you.